All right. Hi. So I'm going to give a, a talk this evening about uh, what I like to call activist metadata. First off, I'm Harlow. <clears throat> uh, I currently work for a group called The Guardian Project. We build um, primarily mobile, but not entirely, uh, software that uh, is built for circumvention technology. And our clientele, well, I mean, everyone, we, we want everyone to use the, the apps, but um, uh, we also do a lot of hands-on support for uh, journalists, legal clinics, um, human rights activists, and other you know, do-gooders all over the world. Uh, I also just finished a uh, fellowship at the New York Times sponsored by the uh, Mozilla and uh, both the Mozilla Foundation and the Knight Foundation, uh, which are both large supporters of the press. Um, and I had worked with the uh, computer assisted reporting team on uh, their their workflows of documents. Uh, my my research interests right now um, are and have been for the past couple of years are in metadata. And that's a really, really sexy word right now. So what's metadata? I Googled it. I Googled it. OK, so there are two types of metadata, structural metadata and design metadata or whatever. Actually, metadata is data about data, data that describes the data that you're looking at. Um, by way of illustrating what metadata is, I decided to actually uh, go to the image search um, because that right there, this is what metadata is. You will get the answer to your question um, via the just by being around the question and seeing what kind of data pops up to the fore. Uh, you'll notice that the most, one of the most popular uh, associations with the word, with the term metadata, um, as you can see, because it's been pushed to the forefront of the Google image search, is you know NSA. And of course, in living in the uh, post Snowden world, you guys all understand exactly how that particular or, or how this word got associated with the NSA in such a way that it was pushed to the top of Google's image searches. So that's like a very, very interesting way of thinking about what metadata actually is. So how can it be activisty? I'll give you a couple of examples. This one I really, really like by um, a journalist from Reuters named Megan Toy. Um, I really hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Uh, where uh, she investigates the, uh, the, these illegal exchanges of adopted children in the United States via uh, advanced searches um, on Yahoo groups. And she was actually able to, to call a lot of this data in an automated way, massage it uh, using techniques, I mean, of course, data scraping techniques and natural language processing in order to paint this picture about how children in our country are just being, you know, like tossed around um, from family to family like you would a car or, you know, a used Prada bag or something like that. Here's another example that I love um, from a group called Situ Studios uh, out in London. Uh, this is uh, an analysis of ballistic forensic analysis of an event that took place, um, you know, on uh, in the uh, in the Palestinian region, having to do with you know a protest. Um, a protester was shot by an Israeli soldier. And the culpability of that soldier was eventually proven via a forensic uh, analysis of the video of that protest event that was taken from just by, you know, haphazardly taken from three different angles. And then Situ Studio, which is actually an architectural firm, uh, took that video, or took those three videos uh, and were able to prove culpability based off of the, uh, the image metadata um, captured inside the videos alongside with, you know, various like matching up audio, matching up camera angles and things like that. These are really, really excellent, excellent examples <clears throat> of activist metadata. However, these examples are kind of few and far in between for a couple of reasons. And actually that prevents them from being activisty. I'll tell you why. Um, the forensic, the ballistic forensic, uh, information, you know, uh, you in order to, to achieve that particular domain knowledge actually takes a lot of, of study. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of investment to actually peruse the scientific journals that aren't necessarily open to you uh, because you don't 
uh, have the domain knowledge and you're not part of the university system or whatever barriers are in your way that prevent you from actually achieving this domain knowledge and put it to data. Also, there's a, uh, there's a you know, a kind of stereotype of the nerd once again. Uh, <laughs> when you Google a nerd, there you go. Um, that profile you know, Google, of course, being the absolute unmitigated truth, uh, that profile doesn't necessarily match the profile of those who are sitting in human rights organizations or in press outlets trying to answer these questions. Another thing that stands in people's way is money. And actually, uh, there's a, a system that, that works on a lot of these domain-specific questions in an elastic way uh, called Palantir, which is a really, really great program. However, it's um, incredibly expensive. Uh, no one has, it's not open source, despite the fact that they use the terms open and source so much on their websites. It's not, it's a very closed source program. The open source that they're talking about is the data that they pull down from it and work on. Um, that said, <clears throat> Uh, what we what we decided to do was to to find a way to uh, answer questions using metadata, uh, creating tools that were elastic enough for people to use under any scenario they can they can imagine, uh, that kind of looked like Palantir but was 100% open source and for the people. So this started out with a project that um, I started with the Guardian Project, uh, an organization called Witness and the International Bar Associ Association um, called InformaCam. It's a horrible name and I'm very sorry. But uh, the, for instance, you take a photograph or a video um, and we, we all are aware of EXIF data, but we decided that we were going to add a whole bunch of extra metadata. So in addition to you know your EXIF data, you also have uh, your um, your accelerometer data. So the way that you actually hold uh, the the device as you're taking a photo or framing your perfect shot. Um, we also uh, sample things like light meter values because that actually corroborates any story you might tell about what time of day it is. We uh, Ge you know, geo is l latitude and longitude, that's kind of like old. Uh, we decided that we could better corroborate location by adding extra data points such as, you know, uh, visible cell tower IDs, um, visible Wi-Fi devices, and, and, and stuff like that. Um, I'll tell you an interesting story about the Wi-Fi devices. Uh, but we also allowed people to add in, you know, like human readable bits of data. Um, so, you know, in the, uh, the protest example, you can say like, that's the policeman that shoved me or whatever. And uh, all of this information was then taken and imported into a, a program that I'll talk to you about very shortly um, and made automatically indexable and searchable. So you could actually run queries, run Google-like queries that says, show me all of the meta or show me all of the photos that were taken, you know, at the on the Brooklyn Bridge around this one particular cop in the area. So in our in our uh, initial uh, uh, experiments with this particular program, we actually kind of noticed that, and you'll see on the on the right side of the screen, we have some Wi-Fi networks. Uh, there, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it here, but we started to notice that a lot of those BSS IDs, which actually correspond to routers that you might see in in a room, um, were showing up as all zeros. And actually what that means is that you, you probably have a case of um, MC catchers or like, you know, like stingrays or something like that on your hands. So that became an interesting data point, you know, to say like, show me all the protest photos where there was a stingray. So uh, we built a couple of versions of this, one being uh, the version that we built for the International Bar Association that is a little bit more streamlined. Um, in addition to taking all that metadata, you're able to tag stuff and say like, that's the victim, that's the perpetrator or whatever, uh, that was indexable and searchable. We also built a version of it that was uh, had a simpler and more graphically intensive interface for a group of, um, or, or for a legal clinic in the southern United States for migrant farm workers. So they could actually take selfies to check in at work and if ever a, uh, uh, a farmer said that so and so was not working, you know, seven hours on this farm. He was only working six. We could actually show them the metadata and say that you're going to have to pay this person for the work that they did.
Uh, this app actually also allowed people to take incident reports for you know on the job uh, uh, safety violations and also took track of um, how much lunch they or how long their lunch breaks were so um, we could you know file more like long-term further like reaching reports the the software that we use to pull down all and make use of all this data um, is our open source version of Palantir, which I call Unvalence. Um, it is a program that allows you to, uh, it, it's actually, it's kind of like a, a, a mixture of Palantir, which I described before, and Dropbox. So, you know, as you can just take, you know, a group of files, dump them in your folder, and then in the background, just as Dropbox does, it performs calculations on the on the uh, the documents that you put into this folder, and it allows you to take that data from those calculations and massage them into whatever uh, questions you might have to, to answer. And so, um, Working with the Guardian Project and the New York Times, I was able to, to bring this about, and I started to use it to answer some more questions because, you know, what good are you if you're not trying to, like, muck rack, rake, right? So I thought about the, um, <clears throat> the recent uh, uh, group of documents that came out of Darren Wilson's um, grand jury trial and uh, how there are a lot of like really interesting reports circulating uh, about uh, how the how the officer's perception of Michael Brown colored the way that colored colored the way that uh, he treated him, uh, and having to do with you know his size and his race, and how that gave him the illusion of more or that that gave him the illusion of, of a more dangerous suspect. So um, I put that the grand jury testimony data um, through some uh, accelerated test searches using the unveilance engine um, having to do with, you know, like how they talk about this man's size. Uh, and we, uh, this is a little video here where um, we've done some topic modeling based off of the search terms that we had here. And down at the bottom, we have like groups of subjects that come out of natural language processing that inform where in these various parts of, you know, the, the depositions, um, people are talking about his size and how they're talking about his size. And we noticed that like a lot of these things um, <laughs> are usually like linked to drugs and like a paranoia that, you know, this is like a crazy person on some sort of hallucinogenic drug or whatever. And so we were able to then um, search deeper within the, the corpus of documents. Actually, that pink document number five is uh, Darren Wilson's testimony himself. The OCRing, which is um, how you uh, use optical recognition in order to get text out of like PDF documents, is a little bit imperfect. So um, uh, our engine actually uh, allows you to kind of edit that if you need to and then run those processes again. Uh, but this is the unedited document. <clears throat> and then finally, we come to, this is once again, the grand jury testimony of Darren Wilson, um, able to kind of run this through more natural language processing where we can figure out, uh, or we can map certain terms like marijuana and gun and stuff like that and his largeness or whatever onto specific parts of the document. Um, in order to draw certain conclusions about stuff like that. So where next? Uh, something that I found interesting, this is a project that actually we're working on this week um, with the help of some of the uh, other speakers that you'll hear from tonight and the other evenings. Um, working on a project called Foxy Doxing, <laughs> which is inspired by this interesting case that came out like a couple of uh, weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, uh, about how a woman uh, who had been attacked on Twitter by, you know, the trolls, um, decided to take forensic analysis into her own hands um, in order to find out who was uh, uh, attacking her online. Um, and what I find interesting about this particular uh, uh, scenario is that uh, the woman here, uh, she was incredibly, you know, I mean, she, she's a security researcher who works for the Tor project, so she's incredibly technically savvy of a developer, as you can imagine. Um, and the tools that she had used and the techniques that she had used are not necessarily uh, available to anyone who might seek protection. Unfortunately, what I've come to learn um, from working with several newsrooms and to speak and in speaking to several journalists, particularly women, but not always, um, is that there's a huge disconnect 
uh, between the, or actually there's no technical capability at any of their newsrooms to protect them from these particular threats. And that's actually kind of, it's kind of sad given that, you know, this one particular security researcher was able to kind of fend for herself and, and you know, find her attackers. Yet you go to somebody who works for the Washington Post and she can't do anything. The Washington Post can't do anything. So um, that's, that's where we're going next with this particular engine. Um, and so uh, the strengths and weaknesses are, uh, is as I was mentioning domain-specific knowledge before, um, like that forensic ballistic example, I personally, like I, I didn't spend, you know, decades uh, researching natural language processing. I don't plan on spending much more <laughs> doing natural language processing, but the uh, because uh, this engine that we've created is open source, it actually runs on gists on GitHub from specific users. So if someone who has more domain specific knowledge than I do looks at my little snippets of code that run those like integral pieces of, of programming and says, well, you know, you might want to change that. They can submit, um, you know, a, a, a some some sort of edits to GitHub, and if I accept them and run the documents uh, through the processes over again, we can actually get better at analyzing things together. Um, and that's it. So, thank you for listening to my little uh, show and tell. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>